Glad to see everybody here today. Glad to see Reverend Horner and his wife here today. He's going to bring the message here in just a little while. It's always good to listen to him because he's got some good preaching. All right, let's turn to page 355 and stand and let's sing Jesus Paid It All. 355. I stand as we say.
at the Olympia Club from 6 until 7 p.m. Uh, Monday is the Mama Bear Bible Study, chapters 8 and 9 at 7 p.m. in the back of the church. It's not too late to join in. Uh, Wednesday, the prayer meeting at the Elders, most at 7 p.m. Please let them know if you plan to attend. Uh, Saturday, we have it at its own slot. Valentine's dinner and game night. Uh, Hot love dinner, fried chicken provided starting at 5 p.m. Please at RSVP to Heather Hartman. Uh, bring your favorite game to share and prepare for some exciting group games. So please come out uh, for the uh, Valentine dinner and game night. I just uh, tested some games on my aunt, so uh, it may involve blindfolded this. Oh, no. It'll be good. If you don't get to RSVP or you invite other people, that's fine. We just want to get a general head count. Yeah. But, but feel free to invite other people to this. Yeah, invite whoever you like, and, and uh, we just want to get a general head count. So give us an idea of how many you'll have coming. Let's see. Uh, February 26th, uh, Sunday Spread Light. Uh, come to the service early for uh, coffee. On February 26th. That's uh, next Sunday. That's next Sunday. Yep. Yeah. <coughs> All right. Going by quick. Um, April 1st is church cleaning day. Um, many hands make light work, so please come out on April 1st and, and help out with uh, doing some cleaning around the church. Also, save the date. Uh, BBS Keepers of the Kingdom will be our BBS program this year, Masters in Genesis. Uh, June 25th is when we plan to have BBS. Um, in February, please join us in praying and fasting and focus um, on uh, praying for our new pastor. Uh, we've been asking everyone, uh, 7 a.m. each morning, if you would, please, um, pray for um, God to pre pre prepare the man that he would have to leave us. So if you join us in that 7 a.m. each morning, we would appreciate it. Um, and we'll be announcing the next council meeting in not too long. Um, Friday and Saturday, March 17th and 18th, is the Fellowship of Bible Church's Spring Retreat at Camp De Higlo, uh for men, women, and teens, and there's more information on that uh, on the back table. Um, let's see. Also, Saturday, March 4th, at 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. is a trail work day at Camp De Higlo. Um, for teens and adults, lunch is provided, and there's also information on that in the vestibule in the back of the church. Have a few things here that we've been praying for. Um, Barb and Miss Dean's friend, um, Bonnie Hinkhouse, uh, we're still praying for her. Uh, she's uh, in the end stages of cancer there, so please just pray. Well, she was in hospice. Okay. She's back home. Oh, she's back home now. Yeah. Uh, she, she said when she passes, she wants to be home. Okay. So she's. <laughs> She's uh, back home from hospice, but still keep her in prayer. And, and um, again, she's in the end stages of cancer there, so pray for her comfort there. Um, and uh, Heather had mentioned she had some co-workers, a grandson that was in the hospital. Uh, she has a co-worker, has a grandson that's in the hospital on a ventilator with a rare genetic disorder. Uh, so please keep, uh, please keep him in your prayers. Um, and she also had a co-worker who lost a daughter to suicide. Uh, please keep the family there in, in their prayers. Um, Alan and Carolyn Horsey, um, they've, uh, they need some prayer as well, um, just you know, for healing and comfort, and, and uh, that they'll be able to get back out and, and be back with us again. Please pray for the Intersection Church, um, the uh, missions trip to the Dominican Republic, um, they should be returning tomorrow. Okay, so they're coming back. So right. just pray for them for their travels and you know everything goes well there with their uh, flight back and everything. Um, and of the, the team there, Christina's gone there many times, but of the 12 people, nine of them are either current or former faculty and students oh, okay. of our school. So right. it's not our school's thing, it's the church there, but right. we have a lot of people, a lot of people from, from the guests. school. Yeah, so it's been able to connect, and from what I've seen, postings on Facebook, it looks like it's been a good week. So I'm excited to hear <coughs> their full report when they come back. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So, um, yeah, glad that they had a had a good trip there, and Christina maybe mm -hmm. fills in after they fill you in. Let us know how their trip went. Certainly. Um, my niece Kelly, uh, her husband had taken his own life there. Mm -hmm. It's been a month or two ago, I guess. And uh, please.
please keep them in prayer. Uh, their family, just a lot of things. She had to change jobs and, you know, the house and just a lot of things like that. So please keep them in your prayers. Uh, my Uncle Harold, who him and my Aunt Annette have visited here, Uncle Harold, in the nursing home. And uh, he has good days and bad days. Just pray, be in prayer for him if you would. Um, Miss Jean's nephew, Chance, is now home. And he's been doing pretty good. She yeah, doing very good. He's doing very well. But just continue to keep him in your prayers that everything will keep going well. Thank you. And um, Judy's uh, cousin, Linda Arbaugh, had a stroke in October. She's still in a nursing home. And Linda is in her 60s, right? So, I mean, she's, uh, she needs some prayer. Hopefully, you know, heal her and get her back home. So, uh, any other announcements that, that I missed? Jess? I keep forgetting to tell you guys that we're selling subs again for school. So, okay. if you want subs, let me know. Of course, I forgot the papers today, but I can write it down. I have a picture of it. So, let me know if you're interested. Okay, yeah, let, let Jess know if you'd like to buy it. So to support the school. They're delicious. Yeah, they are yeah. good. We like to do like sub night for dinner. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's good. So any other announcements on this? All right. This time we'll have a special meeting and after that Pastor Fred will bring us a message. Church is, 
Uh, but uh, we always had the early service here on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock, and I'd come and preach, and then uh, I would go back to Uniontown. They were having Sunday school while I was here, and then I'd preach in the late service over there. And then <clears throat> we'd have a, an evening service at, uh, for a good period of time. We'd have it here one Sunday night, the next Sunday night at Uniontown. When it was over there, you'd go over there. When it was here, they'd come over here. It worked out well. And uh, uh, those, are, those are good memories that I have, and there are many more like that. John uh, asked you and I to pray for something very important, and that is uh, uh, the search for a pastor. And that blessed my heart to hear a leader of the church stand up and ask the congregation to pray that God would provide a pastor for us here. And um, I, I thought of what Jesus said when John asked us to pray. Uh, and, and what Jesus said, that's it recorded in the Gospels, uh, Jesus said, Ask, and ye shall receive. Uh, seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Now, that was written in Greek originally, in the Greek text. Those words, uh, ask, seek, and knock, were written in such a way that it means ask and keep on asking. Don't stop praying about this. Um, uh, seek and keep on seeking. Uh, if the first guy that you look at doesn't match, keep seeking. Keep seeking. The promise is that you'll find one, and then knock, keep on knocking. If the door doesn't open immediately, knock again. If it didn't open the third time, knock again. Now, this is not my message. It is all free. <laughs> We've got a lot to go here. Uh, that's the message up there. But I'm trying to encourage you. You're moving in the right direction, and you're going it the right way. Now, just another word or two about finding a pastor. I caution you. Don't look for a perfect pastor. There's none out there. You won't find one. Uh, we're all imperfect. We're human beings. And we make mistakes. Uh, but look for one who is willing. Uh, someone that is willing to come to Frizzleburg to be the pastor of the Frizzleburg Bible Church. Look for that guy. That has to be in his heart as well as in your heart. And uh, if the first one that comes uh, uh, doesn't show that, you know, he's really sold that God wants him to pastor a, a small country, uh, little community church. Look for someone who is. And, um, and then uh, uh, be patient with whoever comes to be your pastor. He doesn't know it all. I can remember when I moved into Uniontown in 1962, I had never had a funeral. I had never married anyone. I had never stood behind a pulpit and preached a message as a pastor. I had stood behind pulpits and preached. But I was just a young man that was willing to do something that God wanted me to do. And so uh, look for someone that you can grow with, someone that you can encourage. Now, if God should send you a seasoned pastor, praise God for that. Uh, you will have a head start if it's a man who has uh, experience and loves the Lord and loves the people and, and uh, preaches the Word of God. Latch on to him. But if God sends you a young person, don't turn him away because of his youth. Uh, and you're good at that because you have given young men, other pastors, opportunity to be a pastor. Do it again. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. We're going to start here, but quickly we're going to go back to Exodus 31 in the Old Testament. Uh, Matthew chapter 25 uh, has um, uh, the... Uh, the phrase, the words of our study this morning, uh, the, uh, the good and faithful servant. And that's what the message is about. I'm going to share with you what a good and faithful servant uh, looks like. Uh, who a good and faithful servant is. And then we get that from Matthew chapter 25. And verse 14 says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man going into, going into a traveling into a far country. Now, this is a message that Jesus preached on the uh, Mount of Olivet. This is called the Olivet Discourse. This is one of his, like a parable, that he's going to tell. tell. 
And the parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so we're going to read one thing, but we're supposed to understand something else in this story. So let me try to interpret that as I go. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man. The man there is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ came to earth and he ministered for 33 and a half years. And then we know that at the end of that 33 and a half years, after his death, burial, and resurrection, he ascended and went back into heaven. So um, the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. Far country is heaven. Who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And, and unto one he gave five talents, uh, and to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. So the Lord went back to heaven. And now, then he that received the five talents traded and made five others. In verse 17, he had them... Uh, <clears throat> Had re others he had uh, received uh, two, he also gained two. But he that received one talent, digged in the earth, made a hole, buried his talent, and after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming back again, and when he comes back, one of the things that's going to happen is that his children, his servants that he left behind, that was Peter, James, John, Andrew, those guys back 2,000 years ago, today it's you and I, we were his servants, we've left, been left here, and it says, uh, when he cometh and reckoneth with his servant. So there is a, a time coming when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to examine you and me. Actually, he's going to examine our works to see what they be, whether they be good or bad. And, uh, and, and in verse 21, we have these words. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Verse 23. His Lord said unto him, the second man, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Entering into the joy of the Lord <clears throat> is being received into heaven uh, with all the amenities that heaven has to offer. The joy that comes by being in heaven is indescribable. We can't even explain it. But verse 24 says, Then in which then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art in a hard man, uh, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathered where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went out and hid thy talent in the earth, and lo, uh, their house hast that which is thine. He gives back the Lord just the one that the Lord gave him. And then the Lord said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. We're not going to concentrate on the wicked and slothful servant, no. <coughs> because I don't think there's any of those here in the congregation. If it is, take warning, because it doesn't, but it did well, uh, by well for that man that didn't do anything for the Lord while he was on the earth. Matter of fact, uh, he was an unsaved person that pretended that he was, and but he's cast into outer darkness, where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. But the five talent servant and the two talent servant heard his Savior say, their Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I am sure that everyone in this room that is born again, you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you want to hear him say at that time, because every one of us uh, that have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior are going to stand before him someday at the great, uh, not the great white, the, the judgment seat of Christ. There are two different ones. The great white throne judgment is for the, uh, the wicked and fossil one who is cast into the garden. That's going to hell. But uh, the uh, Lord Jesus is going to allow us to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to stand before the Bema seat, the judgment seat, which is a judgment of by Jesus Christ of every servant that was his here on this earth to determine just what uh, rewards he's going to give 
uh, to that person. And I am sure that all of us here that um, have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we want to hear him say those words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I have fond memories of uh, Bob Fitz, the pastor of the Waynesboro Bible Church, and probably many of you have heard that name and have even met Bob. He was one of my best friends, a pastor friend. Uh, we shared many things together. We prayed together. We, uh, we enjoyed life together. We served the Lord together. And, and uh, uh, toward the end of his journey, as his life was, uh, was eking away and he knew he didn't have much longer to live, he said to me, Fred, I want to finish well. <coughs> That's what this message is about, to encourage you and my own heart to finish well to do the job right, to get it done, to serve the Lord faithfully, to stand before him eventually and finally, and to see his smile on his face, him clapping his hands as he says, well done, Fred, you is a good servant, faithful servant, and you should have the desire, you want to hear him say that about you as well. I'm sure you do, so let's get down to work. Go to Exodus chapter 31. Uh, we find a man in the Old Testament um, that, that is in the category of a faithful and good servant. And we're going to use him as our example. We're going to use him as our model, our role model. Uh, in Exodus chapter 35, I don't know, did I say 35 or 36? 35 is where I want you to be. Exodus chapter 35. <clears throat> and... Uh, we want to use Bezalel, that's the man's name, that's a, uh, a name that we don't hear too often. Um, Exodus, I said, I'm sorry, I'm not even in the right place. Exodus 31, no wonder I couldn't hear what I put it down my, my Bible, I didn't see his name. It's in verse 2 of chapter 31 of Exodus. Are you there? I get to a little while to get there, didn't it, huh? It says, and the Lord spake unto the Lord, is saying, see, I have called by name, Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones, to set them and in carving of timber, uh, to work in all manner of workmanship. And behold, I have given with him Aholiam, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, and in the, uh, and in the hearts of all that were wise-hearted, I put wisdom, and so forth and so forth. Here is a man, the name of Bezadiel, in the Old Testament times. He was born in Egypt, uh, sometime before the Exodus, before God chose Moses to lead of Israel out of Egypt into the Promised Land. Uh, here's a man that uh, went from Egypt into uh, the wilderness with Moses. They crossed the Red Sea together, and they uh, and apparently Bezalel uh, lived his whole rest of his life in the wilderness because he is not one that went into the land because of the judgment upon the nation at that time. So he is the good and faithful servant uh, that we want to uh, to consider. Uh, he is presented as a gifted craftsman. If you notice what we said and what we read in these verses, he was a craftsman. He was skilled in the secular field of woodworking, carpentry, uh, metalworking. He could take gold or silver or some other metal and, 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 and form a beautiful object out of it. Uh, that's what he was doing when he got his call. Uh, he was uh, a bricklayer. But he used his abilities, his natural abilities that he had developed over time. Uh, it didn't just happen to him. Uh, he, he was already working with his mind and with his hands uh, and doing these things. He could cut down a tree. Uh, he could uh, uh, get the lumber out of that tree and he could make a table. Uh, he could take a lump of gold and melt it down and then uh, make a beautiful object like a candelabra out of it. Uh, so, Bezalel, back then, uh, he was a skilled worker 
that used his abilities to serve God. It would be like today a secretary uh, uh, being a, uh, a person being a secretary for Christ. Someone who is a secretary and goes to the office every day and does secretarial work. But at the same time, doing it as a born-again believer, doing that work of secretarial work uh, to please God. Could be a farmer. It could be a carpenter. It could be a bricklayer. It could be a, 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 one of these guys at the IT, uh, uh, working with computers and being a technician. The idea that we get from Bezalel is, whatever it is that you do for a living, use that way of life, providing for yourself and your family, in a Christ-like way. Doing it so that those that see you do your work, whatever it is, realize that you're different from the others that do the same thing that you do. Like going to an office, where I say there's 10 employees, and two of you are Christians, and the other eight are non-believers. The two are Christians, should go about doing the things in the office that they are to do in such a way that the other eight will see Christ-likeness in you and how you do your work. Uh, think now, right now at this moment, what it is that you do for a living. If you're still laboring or still employed, earning a living, what is it that you do? Don't say it, just think it. And um, those of you that are retired from full-time work, and uh, you no longer go and do what you used to do every day. What was it that you did? Did the way you go about your work or the way you used to go about your work, does it amplify, elevate Christ-likeness, Christ-awareness? Um, does the people around you that work is working with you react? Did you react differently when something adverse happened? in the office or on the farm or whatever it is, then the other eight that uh, swears or uh, curses or gets angry or blows up or walks away, or did you handle it or are you handling it differently? Are you doing it for the Lord as if the Lord himself was there doing it? That's the idea that we have here. So. Bezalel, the model of a good and faithful servant, consider his character for a moment with me. Consider his character. Uh, Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 and 2 again. Um, the Lord spake to Moses, I have called it by name Bezalel. And uh, we get somewhat of his character out of his name. You know, in the Old Testament, the names mean something, but for the most part. Parents chose a name for their son when he was born indicating what it was they wanted their son to be, what they wanted their daughter to be, uh, how they wanted their son or daughter to portray themselves, to portray some quality. Bezalel, his name means in the shadow of God. Bezalel means in God's shadow, living under the wings of the Almighty, living close to God, being so close to God that, that his shadow overshadows you at all times. His name, uh, he's the protection of God, or in the protection of God. And his mom and dad chose that name because apparently they realized the value of living in the shadow of the Almighty, of, of, of being in the shadow of God. Uh, now, he receives his name from, from godly parents. His father was Uri. His grandfather was Hur, the guy that held Moses' hands up and, and gave Joshua the victory in the valley. That was his grandfather. His great-grandfather was, was Caleb, Joshua's friend, that great warrior of God, Joshua and Caleb, those men of faith, the ancestors of Bezalel. They called him a name that he lived up to. We see that in all the verses. He received his name. He was of the tribe of Judah, and Judah means uh, uh, praise Yahweh. Um, and, uh, so he was from the tribe that was responsible for carrying on the praise of God, 
in Old Testament times. Do you see in this Bezalel a, a sort of a standout? Uh, a man a little bit head and shoulders above? Uh, someone who has character. Someone you can depend on. Someone who exudes with righteousness. That's what we get from his name. His character. And uh, his forefathers knew from experience what it was like, what life was like in the days in which they lived. They lived in hard times. They lived in the wilderness. They had to depend on God for manna. They had to look to God for water. They, uh, life was hard. And it was good to stay near to the God that has caused you. Stay near him. Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Stay close to God, you'll be in his shadow. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I will trust. Say that in your heart if you want to be a good and faithful servant. Say, I will... Say the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. In Him I will trust. They are the Old Testament prophet that, that a prophet with a little, little book uh, informed the Old Testament people of God that it was good to flee to God in times of trouble. Nahum 1 7 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knoweth them that trust Him. The Lord knew Bezalel and trusted him to do the work of making the uh, furniture for the tabernacle, that beautiful house of God. Uh, he must have been living a life pleasing to God at the time of Exodus 31, 1 and 2, because he's the one that God said to Moses, I've chosen him. God would not have chosen an ungodly person to build the uh, furniture of the tabernacle because that entire structure everything about that structure pointed to Jesus Christ the Son of God and uh, so God chose a man of godly character that knew how to abide not by the sight of God to abide in the shadow and today we who are serving the Lord Jesus Christ I challenge you to consider your lifestyle is it holy? Is it godly? Is it righteous? Is it good? Does it honor God? Does the way you live your life please God? If you want to be a good and faithful servant and hear Christ say it at the Bema seat, you begin with character. And character comes by allowing the God that lives within you to change you from the inside out until you are like the Lord Jesus Christ himself in the way that you think and the way you talk and the way you <coughs> A good and faithful servant be, will, be, will be one who has become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Secondly, the call of a good and faithful servant of God. The call is twofold. And uh, I draw your attention back to Exodus 31, verse 2. See, I have called by name. There's his call. God has called. Bezalel, come over here. God said, I got something I want you to do for me. And Bezalel came running. Uh, here's the, uh, the call of man who was rather different. I think we would call him a man of many hats. Um, a, a jack of all trades. If you read down these verses <clears throat> that have to do with Bezalel. And you see what God had asked him to make. And what that man was able to do. It's amazing. It's astounding. God called him. God saw the potential in that man. And God called him by name. And God knows your potential. Don't forget that. We often say when we're asked to do something, I could never do that. But if God asks you to do it, he sees potential. He knows you can do that. Because he will do the same thing for you that he did for Bezalel that he does for me quite frequently. Under normal circumstances, I could not stand behind a pulpit like this in front of an audience like this and say what I'm saying like the way I'm saying them. This is of God, dear to the love, but I'm a bashful um, introvert, naturally. But I have been promised by God that if I will do what he asked me to do, that he will do it through me. The call to serve God 
first of all, uh, is a spiritual call. You have to be called to salvation before you can become a servant of God. You have to be saved before you can serve. That's the order. It has always been. It's the order in the Bible. Every man who stands out as a man of God heard God call first. Come uh, to and trust Him. Bezalel was no, no uh, exemption. Bezalel had to respond to the instructions of God in his day. And that instruction was... Uh, that um, uh, and they were still in the land of Egypt when this happened and you know the story of the death angel that came across the land and, and um, God said that he was going to send this uh, death angel the Lord uh, of death was going to come through it was going to destroy the kill the firstborn of, uh, of all even of uh, male and beast except those that had been told would take that lamb that God said they should choose Slay the lamb and take the blood and apply it to the door. And God says, when I pass over, I, when I come and see the blood on the door, I will pass over. Bezalel did that. He was part of the crowd in Egypt that applied the blood on the very first Passover that God established. And, of course, we all know that that is typical. It's a, it's a picture of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Every Old Testament person from Adam to <laughs> Abraham to Moses to David, Samson, all of these people, they had to trust what God said about forgiveness of sin by looking forward to the day that Jesus Christ would die on the cross. Today we stand and we look back and we have to trust Jesus Christ who has already died on the cross. Same thing, we want to look forward, we look back. But it's a matter of faith, it's a matter of grace. Bezalel responded to the call of God for salvation. God would not have used him if he was an ungodly man, he used him because he was a man that trusted God. Uh, all, uh, <clears throat> all that is uh, uh, in our text about him uh, shows us that, uh, that uh, he was a, a person that was born again. But then the second part of the call is the call to service. First, it's a call to salvation. 